Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Kathleen Rasmussen and I and my husband Norm will be hosting this broadcast today. Today we're in the beautiful state of Florida where we will be filming the testimony of a very special young lady who we don't normally get testimonies this way but we got a hold of her testimony through our website on it's called www.preciousTestimonies.com and we just really felt in our hearts to contact her and see if she would be willing to share and that's why we're here and so today we're going to be filming a, a woman by the name of Linda Lane and she has so much to share. There is so much that God has done for her and we just pray that you will listen and see what maybe God has for you because I'm sure that there's a lot of areas that she will be touching on that a lot of people can relate to and Precious Testimonies is a program where we allow born-again Christians to come and share what God's done in their lives and to give Him the glory. That's what this is all about, to give Him the glory. And we, we, we play these, these testimonies in various stations throughout the country. So if you're in Michigan and you're wondering why we're dressed so, so lightly like for summer, that's because we're in Florida. <laughs> we're not in the cold weather right now. And we're just so thankful for that, to be able to be here and to do this. And the name that of the person who's sharing, her name is Linda Lane, and she's going to be coming on very shortly here. And I just encourage you to listen. Sit back and listen and see what God maybe has for you, okay? Thank you. God bless you. Hi, my name is Linda Lane, and I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony with you today. This is a, a blessing and an honor for me. Um, I'd like to start with a little bit about my childhood background. Um, I grew up out in California and I come from a very dysfunctional family. There was a, a, several types of abuse from men of mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, uh, it was very chaotic and, and very noisy in my home all the time. Um, when I was about five years old, my mother had joined a Buddhist church, and I started attending that with her, and Buddhism came natural for my mother because she's from Japan, I'm, and I'm half Japanese, and um, I went to the Buddhist church all the way up through my adolescence, and during that time, uh, my father would abandon the family on many occasions, leaving my mother to raise three girls by herself. And um, for her, belonging to this Buddhist organization uh, gave her some place to, to belong. You know, there were people there that could speak her language and, and, uh, and helped her along the way. During my teenage years, I started to get involved into the, in the occult there was um, an occult shop that had opened up down the street from my home and I started going there and it was very mysterious and very dark and, and I found it fascinating and I went to the public library of all places and I checked out library books on, on Satanism, on witchcraft and uh, just different occult issues and started studying this fervently. And through this, I started feeling like I had a sense of power, that for the first time in my life I belonged someplace, that I had control over something. And I want to tell you that even just dabbling in tarot cards or going to get your palm read or anything, reading your daily horoscope, many people can think that it, it's very... Um, you know, innocent and that no harm can really come from this and you really don't mean anything by it. And it's just entertaining. I just want to check. But I'm here to tell you 
and to give my testimony and my witness that this can be very deadly. It opens doors to, to Satan. It opens doors to a darkness and to an evil that you cannot shut once that's open. And the only person that can close this door is Jesus Christ. And so if you're thinking about dabbling or you're dabbling just a little bit, I, I give you strong caution to back away, to back away and turn to God, turn to Christ. And when I started getting into involved in all of this and, and started doing little rituals and first as little spells and things and one day through ritual gave my life and my heart and my soul and everything that I believe to Satan. And I made Satan my God and my Lord. And I started practicing these, you know, very um, quietly because it's not something, especially back then, that was practiced out in the open, uh, like nowadays, you know. And um, I was still participating in the Buddhist organization. And as time went on, I started falling into a deep depression. And, and it was through a various number of things, you know, like, like drugs and, and alcohol and, and just, you know, not living in a healthy way, um, doing whatever I could to fit in and be accepted by other people. You know, because all my life I just never, never fit in. And I know that's a very common story with many people, you know, trying to find their little niche in the world. And so, over time, I ended up getting married and uh, had a baby and got divorced. And during that time, I started drinking heavily, I mean, very heavily, excessively, and, and tried to drink myself to death. Um, then depression kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then a time came uh, or through started going to organizations, you know, like AA and NA and Al-Anon and all that, and then ended up, you know, I, I didn't drink, and, but the depression was still there. You know, the, the depression, the, the noise in my head, the, the wanting to die, and eventually I got married again, and it's during this point where, where things really started to change in my life. It's when depression really set in, and uh, I was seeing a, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists and antidepressants and doing everything that I could to try to feel normal and to not want to take my life. You know, my daughter was very young at the time, and it, it was very difficult for her to watch her mother not be able to take care of her or herself. And, I ended up remarrying, and this was in 1990, and um, it was a very a brief marriage. And probably out of a year or two of marriage, we probably lived together maybe four months out of that time. And um, it was a very chaotic marriage, to say the least. I, is, there was no peace, and there was no harmony, there was no love, there was, uh, it was a very volatile marriage. And pri well, right prior to that marriage, I was in such depression that um, I tried to take my own life. And my medical doctor had me committed into a psychiatric hospital. And uh, I stayed there for a while, and uh, finally I needed to come back home because I needed to take care of Sarah. My family was living in California, and I was living in Texas at this time, and I had no friends or anybody that I could call, you know, to come help me with my daughter. And later on, um, during this marriage, or during a separation period of this marriage, I. My dog is snoring. <laughs> during, the, the, um, during a separation during this marriage, because we, like I said, it was very volatile, it was on again, off again, uh, I went back to the hospital again, and um, 
we were in the process of a divorce and then my ex-husband came to me and asked that if I would help him to take care of, of his father. Uh, his name is Chuck, my father-in-law. And so, and I agreed because he was dying of cancer and, and he needed help. He needed some place to go. And so my ex-husband and his two teenagers and Chuck moved into my house with my daughter and myself and I helped take care of Chuck and um, I did everything for him from, from trying to cover him up when he's so cold that he can't get warm, uh, from hand feeding him and, and you know if you've ever taken care of somebody that's, uh, that's bedridden and, and uh, not thinking clearly because of medication, you know, it's uh, very trying and it is a labor of love. And uh, through that relationship, Chuck and I really bonded. He was more of a father to me than anybody I'd ever known. He called me daughter. He never called me Linda. He called me daughter. And uh, every night I'd sit with him and, and on weekends and I'd hold his hand. And one night we were talking and I was asking him about being afraid to die. And he said that he wasn't afraid to die, that he was going to go be with Doris. And um, then I was thinking, and I have to add that at this point, my mind had become so twisted and so tormented, literally tormented, that I believed with my heart and my soul, with every fiber of my being, that I had already lived my life and I had died and that I had gone to hell. That this, this was hell because everybody that I knew, everybody that I met, everybody that I married, you know, were people that used people, uh, hurt people. They, they wouldn't think twice about, you know, stealing your soul away from you. And, um, and I just had my mind made up. I knew this was hell and I was never getting out of here and this is just where I belong and this is where I, it'll always be. And I believe that also because when I tried to commit suicide, I didn't die. You know, something would happen or something. And so I, I had come to believe that I couldn't die because I was already dead. And I was thoroughly convinced of this. And so I was talking to Chuck about, you know, letting go of life, you know, just, you know, are you afraid to let go, you know? And, and, uh, and he he's had all the confidence in the world that he would see Doris. And so I didn't say anything and, and I sat there and then I started to leave and he, he was dozing off and he grabbed my hand and so I sat back down and then and for the first time I prayed to God. And, and I remember sitting there holding his hand beside his bed and looking up and I said, God, Chuck's God. You know, because I was looking for Chuck's God, you know, to make sure, because I knew there were a lot of gods and a lot of, you know, spirits and master teachers and everything out there. And so I was looking for Chuck's God and, and, and I told him that Chuck was a good man and that cancer is a horrible, horrible thing and that nobody deserves to have this. And that, you know, I said, Chuck believes in you, God, so you need to either heal him or take him out of here because he doesn't belong in hell. You know, he doesn't deserve to be here in hell. I know I do, and that's okay, but he doesn't. So, you know, please either take him away from here or take this cancer away from him. You know, thank you. And um, within 24 hours, Chuck went home to be with the Lord. And I remember my ex-husband waking me up and in the middle of the night it was actually a little over 24 hours uh, and he woke me up in the middle of the night and told me he was gone and I went in there and I remember my first thought was that he heard me. God heard me. You know, Chuck's God heard me. And hospice came, the fire department came, the paramedics came, the police came, everybody came to, to you know, remove Chuck's belongings, remove his body, document everything that, uh, you know, that he had passed away in natural causes in, a ho in our home. And uh, after they took Chuck out and all his belongings out, and uh, it was just my ex-husband, well, my husband at the time and I, and he stopped me in the hallway and he thanked me 
for being such a wonderful woman that without my help he could not have done this and that nobody else would have done what I did to help him but he's ready to finalize our divorce now and he's ready to move on with his life and it was thank you very much and, and we've already got another house we're having built you know I'm moving out today and uh, thanks and um, that was enough to push me completely over the edge and I had taken the medical leave from work I could not go back to work at that point and I was so depressed and so angry and just if you can fall any further in the pits of hell you know there, there's always a deeper you know if you think that things can't get worse than this things can get worse than this and I was so beside myself and I was so angry and I was I would walk up and down the hallway and just yelling at God you know at Chuck's God and I would just yell things like I know you hear me you know I don't want to be here anymore get me out of here you took Chuck and you come and you take me I don't want to be here anymore I know you hear me and I was so angry because he never took me and every day it was the same thing walking up and down the hallway and yelling at God take me out of here I know you hear me you took Chuck I know you can take me you know and, and it wouldn't happen and and my daughter you know bless her heart she was you know always asking mom can I get you anything mom you know can I do something for you um, another another point here is that during this time I didn't go to counseling anymore I didn't take my medication I didn't go back to the psychiatrist because I had reached a point where I didn't want help anymore I didn't want help I didn't want to talk about this anymore I didn't want anybody to bother me and I didn't want to bother anybody I just wanted out and I didn't know how to get out you know I felt so stuck when you're stuck between life and death and you just don't know which way to go you don't know where you're at you don't know you know you just you just don't know and words cannot describe the despair in my life at that time and my daughter would say I love you mommy and I would yell at her get away from me don't you understand I don't love you I don't love me I don't love anybody or anything I just want out of here I don't want to be here anymore I don't want to be your mother I don't want to be alive I don't want to be dead I just don't want anything I just can't be here anymore don't you understand you know and I would shake her and, and, and I mean not hurt her but you know just like don't you understand and my daughter reached a point of just becoming stone-faced and, and people would mention that to me that she walked like a zombie and just kind of just didn't wouldn't talk to anybody just just very stone-faced and and uh, very withdrawn and then it was during this time uh, and when I finally went back to work uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Colonel Murphy called me into his office and he told me he said um, Linda and he shut his door and he said I could get fired for this but I have to tell you something and he said um, I just want you to know that, that I've been praying for you and little Sarah and I thought, well, you know, how weird, you know, I mean, why is somebody telling me this? And I never had anybody pray for me like that before or tell me that. And he says, I was in church Sunday and the Lord had put a burden on my heart for you too. And I just want you to, to know that. That's all. And then, and then he walked away. And a year went by. He never mentioned it again. Never mentioned Christ to me again. Nothing. It was just business as usual and about a year went by and during this time like I said when you think you've reached bottom you can still get lower and I kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper into, into depression and just into my own hell literal hell and one day Murph called me back into his office and he told me he just when he shut his door and he sat down and he just broke down and started crying and he said, Linda, I've got to tell you this. And he says, the Lord loves you so much. 
and he has such a good life for you and he has so much he wants to give you you know I don't know what's going on in your life I, I don't know you know I, I don't know anything about what's going on but I know I need to tell you this because the Lord has just really put it on my heart to tell you that he's got a life for you and I was more taken back at that time because he was crying and because I'd never had anybody cry for me before and I think I was I was more moved by that gentleman's tears and I just said well thank you <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what to say and during this time also probably about within a few weeks before Colonel Murphy called me in his office this time um, I started thumbing through TV at night and I ran across a Christian television station and they were talking about Jesus and this this love of Christ and the and the, the joy you know the joy of the Lord and and about being blessed and being a blessing and and I was taught through the organization that I belong to the Buddhist organization that Jesus was a, a very smart man uh, he had a lot of wisdom and it's too bad that he died so young because he probably could have done great things and I remember word for word being told that and, um, and that's all I really knew nobody ever witnessed to me my whole life you know and, and that's that's another important thing if you're a Christian and you're listening to this today that just because we're in America and growing up in America does not mean that we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ you know and I hope that the Lord moves in your hearts to share what he's done for you you know and, and to share salvation with these people because not everybody has heard and um, so anyway I started watching this, this these programs and and I couldn't change a station it just didn't want to but I, I couldn't understand what they were saying either because I didn't know what they were I just know I've heard of Jesus and so I started listening and, and uh, at first when I was listening I would have the TV on in my room and then I would be sitting in my bathroom on the floor and then just and, and holding my hair and then just rocking back and banging my head on the wall because I needed to feel something because I felt so numb and, and I just I just you know kept banging the back of my head just over and over again because I needed to feel something to feel alive you know I was so numb and so hurt and so broken you know and and you would think that the Lord would come in and rescue me at this time and, and I know that many many people have have asked for the Lord to come in their lives and, and, and nothing's happened and, and if you're one of those people I want to encourage you to not give up because you know he knows he knows when you're about to take your last breath and he won't let you fall down you know and eventually I went from the bathroom over weeks this was a long process into my bedroom and then I would sit on my bedroom floor and then I would just you know lean and then start hitting on my, the mattress you know and uh, and then I'd sit on the bed and then I started watching and then I noticed people would say this the sinner's prayer and so finally I started praying the sinner's prayer and I did this literally for months you know at least like three or four months I did this on a daily basis every single time somebody would say the sinner's prayer you know any church program and they would pray for Christ and I would pray for Christ and but nothing I kept getting lower and lower and lower and lower and um, one day I was standing there in front of the TV and they were crying and, and talking about the joy of the Lord and, and how much he's you know just the, the love the love of Christ then how much they loved him and how much he loved them and and I was like I don't know how to get this you know they they keep talking about it's by faith well, I don't know what by faith means you know what is this faith how do you get it where does it come from and they say I have to ask him you know but if he's not saving me then you know how's he going to give me faith you know and, and I was just I, I wanted this faith and I started every day asking God for just uh, this faith that they're talking about I want to understand I, I want this faith and um, 
and every day it just you know it was over and over again and then one night as I was saying when they were just talking about the love and and they were crying and just it was a real intimate program of sharing and I stood there and I looked at the TV and I thought how do I get this I, I have asked and I have asked and I've prayed I've gotten on my knees and you know how do I get this and and but nothing and then uh, at work, Colonel Murphy stopped me again and mentioned that I might want to start watching, you know, maybe some Christian programs. And I said, I watch them all the time, you know. And looking back now, I can see that, you know, even though I thought I was broken, you know, I still had that, that pride and that arrogance and where I wasn't completely broken yet, you know. And um, then one night I was watching and I was thinking, you know, how do I get this? And Satan spoke to me and said, you can't have this. This is not real. I put this on to show you what you could have had had you not given your life to me. But you're mine and you're mine for all eternity. And I remember just thinking that was the end. That is the end. I mean, where do you go? And I was walking down my hallway, and my daughter was spending the night at a friend's house that night. And I was walking down the hallway, and I walked into my front living room, and I thought, you know, I can't live, and I can't die. I'm stuck, you know, and I'm in hell. I've asked Jesus to get me out, and he's left me here. And so in my mind, I decided that this is where I needed to be. This is where I belonged. Satan's right. It is my fault. I should have never given my life to him. And right then, I became angry for the first time at Satan. And I sat there. I stood up, and I just verbally, just out loud, said to Satan, I said, you know what? I know I'm in hell. I know this is your turf. But I tell you what. I will no longer be a willing participant. You and I are through. I am so done with you. And I don't know what happens if you get cast out of hell. But if you want to cast me out of hell, that's okay. And maybe I'll go into the ether or to whatever it's called, you know, into a nothingness, the abyss, or the black hole, wherever. I don't care. I would rather spend eternity in nothing than to spend eternity with you. And at that point, I just turned around and one last time, this happened in my living room in Grand Prairie, Texas, I stood up and I yelled at the top of my lungs and I said, Lord Jesus, get me out of here. I don't want to be here anymore. Please save me. Get me out of here. And I said, Lord, I don't know what it is that I did was so wrong to make you make me go to hell, but I want to tell you that I'm sorry, you know, and, and I was apologizing as if apologizing to a friend, and I just said, I, I'm so sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry that I, I pushed you away. I'm sorry I did not know you my whole life. And I know that hurt your feelings, and I didn't mean to hurt you, and I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And I, I was on my knees at this point, and I just begged him one last time. And I said, Lord, I know that you have the strength, and you have the authority, and you have the power to reach down into the pits of hell and snatch me out of here. And I know you can. I know that you can. And I said, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to this earth, and I believe you died for me. And I believe, Lord, that you can save me and you can get me out of here. Please, Jesus, get me out of here. I don't want to be here anymore. And by this time, I'm just said, I'm on the floor and I'm just sobbing. And all of a sudden, I sat up and I got up and I sat on this chair in the living room. And for the first time, for the very first time in my life, I heard silence.
I had never heard silence in my life. All the noise, all the chaos, all the, the, the tormenting, everything stopped. And I heard quiet for the first time in my life. And at that moment, I realized that Jesus Christ had restored me to my right mind. He had given me my sanity back. He had restored my soul. And I know that, and I, I sat there, and uh, when I sat up, and I was just, I was so awed. I've never heard quiet before. Quiet inside and out. It's just quiet. It's the, like the most beautiful sound you ever hear. And while I was sitting there, I heard a different voice than I had ever heard before. And, and I'm not talking some audible voice like speaking to me in the same room. Just a, a voice. It's To me, when God speaks to me, it's like a voice that's, or a thought that's not my thought. And it's a thought that's so pure and so strong and so true and that you know that it can't be anybody else but God. And the Lord spoke to me and for the first time and he said, he's a liar. And it, that, it was so clear that I sat up and I said, what? I mean, I couldn't believe that, it, that this, I can't describe the, the, the sound of this to me. And he said, he's a liar. Everything that he has ever told you or taught you is a lie. And I thought about that and I stood up and I said, well, and speaking of Satan and, and all the stuff that I've studied, you know, I got involved in all the new age stuff and the crystals and, you, you know, you name it. I was in, you know, always just a part of all this stuff. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, I was even teaching my daughter these things. You know, that there is no Jesus Christ and that there's, you know, uh, and there's black witches or, you know, uh, and there's white witches. There's good, you know, good and evil within this metaphysical world. And um, anyway, I sat up and I said, well, wait a minute. If he is a lie, then I'm not dead. And if he's a lie, then I'm not in hell. You know, and if he's a lie, then, then I haven't already lived my life. My life is, you know, my life's not over. You know, if, if Satan is a liar, I am not in hell and I'm not dead. You know, I'm, I'm alive. And I got so mad and yelling at the devil at this point. And I just stood up and I just yelled at Satan and I said, Satan, when I was a child, I gave you my life. And I'm here to tell you that it was not my life to give to you. It never belonged to you. It never has and it never will. That my life belongs to Jesus Christ. And I said, you're going to let go of it now. And you're going to get out of everything in my life. You know, I want you out of every aspect of my life. From this day forward, you know, you have no authority here. And uh, after that... I had gotten a Bible actually from my closet and it was a Bible that I used to use to convert other people into various New Age teachings because in, in the Bible everything that you can find in the New Age, everything that you can find in the occult, you will find in the Bible and what has done is that the words are twisted. Satan takes this and he, and he twists it. And he tries to take, he takes something holy and he makes it evil. You know, you might think you're getting power from Satan or you might get power from, from, you know, witchcraft. You might get power from these things. But I'm here to tell you that Satan will give you power. You have power for a little bit. But he's going to give you enough to reel you in. And he doesn't care about your life. He doesn't care whether or not you want to live or whether you want to die. All Satan cares about is the fact that you don't belong to Christ. That's all he wants is for you to look the other way just for a moment. And Satan will use you up and he will chew you up. He will spit you out and not think twice about it. Because Satan doesn't care if you blow your brains out. Satan doesn't care if you abandon your family or your children. Satan doesn't care about what you feel or what you think. He doesn't care about your soul. He doesn't care. 
All he cares about is keeping you from God. You know, and, and if, you're, if you're into these things, I cannot emphasize enough to trust Jesus. Because he can deliver you from this. Your life doesn't have to be this way. You know? And when my daughter came home the next day, and about my Bible is that, you know, there's things about crystals in there and, and consulting the, the witches, you know, and, and raising spirits. I mean, all these things, sacrifices, everything is in there. And, and I used to take this and then show Christians and say, look, see, it's in the Bible. It's in your word. So it's okay. And they would say, oh, I never knew that was in there. Okay. You know, and then they would start participating in things with me. And, and you know, and, and the same Bible that I used for that perverted purpose was the same Bible that, that I started reading that night. And I cannot, words cannot describe the joy of the Lord and what, what comes. And, and the next, I only knew one Christian song, and, and, and I won't dare sing it. <laughs> I don't sing, except to the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just that one, you know, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, you know? And um, so, and I was standing at the kitchen window. I had the, the window, the blinds up, and I was just staring at the sky and just singing that over and over again. And just staring at the sky and just, just singing the same words over and over again. And I just couldn't break myself away from that. And I was just like, I knew, I mean, I was joy. There was like joy in my life. In my, I had been restored. I had life. And it felt like the first day of my life. And my daughter came home and she said, Mom, you know, can I get you anything? And, and I said, come here, you know. And then and she said, that's okay. Uh, do, do you want anything? And I said, no, come here. Come, you know, come. And then she was very apprehensive because she was afraid of me, you know. And, and, and she walked close and she got a little bit closer. And, and I said, and gently put my hands on her shoulder. And I said, Sarah, I just want to tell you. And I said, he's alive. And she goes, who's alive? <laughs> and I said, Jesus. And she just looked at me because I had been so anti-Christian all along, you know. And then I said, Jesus, I'm telling you, he's alive. He was here last night. He came here last night. He touched my heart, you know, and, and he, he changed me. He's alive. And I said, everything I have ever taught you is a lie. Everything. You know, and I said, I was wrong. Because I didn't know any better, and I was wrong, and I am so sorry. And I said, but I'm here to tell you, if I don't ever tell you anything else, I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is alive, and He's living. You know, He's not dead. And she was a little bit apprehensive at first. And sometime later, we had the opportunity to talk. And, uh, and she was amazed, and she says, Mom, she said, just like that, you were different, you know. And, and I've heard many testimonies over time. And, and uh, if you come to Christ, don't think that, that each salvation is going to be like so dramatic because everybody's different, you know. And, and, and that's one point that I, I really want to emphasize. And, and, you know, I mean, for me, it's just as well as a, as, a, as a bolt of lightning coming down from heaven and, and striking me. It was that dramatic. And, and, but, you know, each person is different. And Christ knows your heart. And He knows what you need. And He knows how to work in your life. And you just got to let Him. And then and by grace, He can come in, you know, and, and He'll do, you know, what He needs to do um, to save your life and to save your soul. And uh, no. And since that day Christ came into my life, my life has not been the same. Um, there's been so many miracles in my life. There's been so much joy in my life. He's healed so much of my hurt and, and, and just all the pains from my childhood, from, from issues with my father to, to my ex-husband and to everything. God has, has truly restored my life back to me. You know, there's a scripture that says that when the Lord's saying that He'll restore the years the locusts have eaten away. 
and God has more than a, a million fold given me back my life. Um, before I go on, I, I would like to add, you know, about Colonel Murphy. Um, after our, I got saved, which, by the way, I didn't realize I had gotten saved because I didn't know enough about Christianity and about getting saved to know that I got saved. All I knew was I was not the same. My life was different and I was not the same and that's all I knew. And it probably wasn't until after about three months that I realized and it was something I read in the Bible. And I was like, I'm saved. I got saved that day, you know. So I, I couldn't tell you that it was on this date or that date, but I know that it was during, during the summertime of, of 93. That's all I know. It was sometime in the summer before October that, that I got saved. And, um, and that was like almost nine years ago now. And every day since that time has been a blessing to me. Every day I thank God for my life. I thank Him for my salvation. I just, words are not enough to say thank you to the Lord for, for restoring my life, my sanity, my mind, my joy, everything. And, and He's given me a wonderful home and a wonderful husband. And um, it's been good. Even during the bad times, it's been good. You know, there, there's still rough roads and, and, and things that we have to walk through and, and that we have to learn. And um, things that we, you know, places we have to grow in our spirit and in our life. And all I, can, all I can do is to keep my eyes on Him and keep walking with Him. You know, because the minute I, I look away, I fall down. And for the last nine years of my life, it's been that way. I, I can't afford to take my eyes off of Him. And um, I, I've come from, from complete and utter bankruptcy, you know, emotionally, mentally, financially, I mean just completely broken and to, to a wonderful place today. You know? After I got saved the Lord had, had made some promises to me and He had promised me a home, a house. And, and I, I, I know in my heart He meant a, a physical house and I knew that and, and so of course when, when the Lord promised me that I start looking at property, I start looking at land, and, and, and I'm, you know, just sure that it's this house, or that house, or this land, you know, and, and I'm blessed the land in the name of the Lord, and, and time goes on, and, and the house never came about. Okay, even though we were living in a house at the time, and we had a home, but this was a different house that the Lord was showing me, and I know for a lot of people it's so easy to say, you know, Oh, maybe I didn't hear from the Lord right, or, or maybe I misunderstood the Lord, or, or maybe I did something and the Lord's taken away from me. He's not going to give it to me. You know, it's like all these things and all these doubts I went through. And this was probably about eight years ago that He had made me this promise. And six years ago, my husband and I got married. And uh, how I met him was through work. And... Uh, Probably about three months before he came into my life, I was driving down the highway and the Lord spoke to me and he told me that he was bringing me somebody. And I said, I don't want anybody. And he said, I'm bringing you somebody. And I said, Lord, I don't want somebody. <laughs> I don't want to get remarried. You know, I want to serve you. I want to live for you. And, and he said, I'm bringing you somebody. And I said, thank you, Lord, but please, no, I don't want anybody in my life. And, and the Lord said, but I want somebody in your life. And I'm bringing you somebody that's going to take care of you. And he's going to love you. And he won't talk about you behind your back. And he won't call you names. He's not going to hit you. He's not going to hurt you. And he's not going to abandon you. He's going to pray over you when you're sick. And He's going to listen to you. And He's going to care about what you have to say. I want these things for you. And I am bringing you somebody.
because I want you to know what it is to be loved. And I mean, what do you say when the Lord says that? You know, I, I couldn't say no, but I still didn't want somebody. And um, I ended up through circumstance meeting my husband and, and we went out and he's a very quiet man very uh, a gentle soul, one of the most gentlest souls I've ever met, you know, just a quiet spirit. And, and uh, at first I'm thinking, well, no, this, this can't be. And the Lord told me that, that this is the one. And I was, absolutely not. It can't be. You know, he's not my type of person, you know. And, and, uh, and the Lord was just persistent. And my husband, Oli, and I would... would uh, start spending a lot of time together and we would talk and, and I would share my testimony and it, it just it's a relationship that is, has grown and uh, in 96 we got married and it's not been easy the whole time because you know I'm human and, and he's human we're all human and and there's you have to learn things like sharing and uh, compromise and I think the difference for, for me in this marriage is that this is my first marriage in Christ. And, it's, uh, and that is, Christ is number one in our relationship. And we know that. And we know that even if we're mad at each other or don't like each other today, we know that we love Christ. And that's first. And that is the strength and the glue that's hold, that holds us together as one. And in spite of arguments, you know, it's, it's been a real test of the wills because we're both very strong-willed people, we're very stubborn people, and, and even though he's quiet, he's, he's got his stubborn streak. And, and uh, it, it's just been a blessing to, to walk through. And it wasn't until right before we moved here to Florida and we were talking about how many times we would get tired of, you know, of just of fighting or, or tired of just of struggling with this marriage. Some days it feels like you're struggling for a long time and other days you're, it's just like bliss, you know. And, and so, um, but one day we realized that in spite of all the ups and downs and, and troubles, you know, with teenagers and, and things like that, that that in spite of all of that, that we've endured through all the hard times. You know, the way that we look at it is that, you know, I, I wouldn't divorce my daughter, you know, and my husband is, is my blood, he is, he is my husband, you know, and, and, and we're related, and I can't cast, we don't, we don't have the option of casting each other away. And before Christ, that was always an option, that was the easy way. You know, it was, it's easy to quit, easy to give up, and, and, but with Christ as the center, over time, there's been many times where I've told the Lord that He's made a mistake. You know, this, this wasn't the right one, and, you know, I begged to differ with you, and, and, and then, but over time, I can look back and, and, or look at our relationship now, and that there is no other, you know. I know that this is a God-given marriage and my husband knows that and and there's a love there that goes beyond lust or temporary love or or the you know the, the shiny package of love that you get and it's all the pretty ribbons and everything and 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 God has truly given us the gift inside of that and, it, and it's enduring and as far as the house is concerned you know, many times I felt that maybe the Lord didn't really promise me a house. And suddenly the, this, uh, well, not suddenly, it was like eight years later since the Lord promised me this house. And uh, an opportunity came to move to Florida. And we've got that house. You know, when my father-in-law died, to help me get through that, I... I planted a garden and in my old house and I planted some Indian hawthorns and, and some crepe myr a, a crepe myrtle tree and I just loved that tree. It was a little baby when I planted it, just a couple feet high, maybe 18 inches high and 
now it's huge. It's like 15 feet high or goes up to probably 20 feet high in the, you know, when the, in the summertime. And the bark of the tree is smooth, you know, it's just it's such a beautiful tree and that tree means so much to me. And before I moved here, I was telling the Lord that how much I was going to miss this tree because it's just important to me. You know, it's a little thing. And I know it's just a tree and, and, and that's probably a stupid thing to be concerned about or to miss. And, and but it, it was just important to me. I never planted anything like that before and it grew and it grew big and, and, and strong. And um, we came and we found a house here and, and I'd looked at the house a couple times and it wasn't until after we moved in that I noticed in the front yard I have a couple crepe myrtle trees. And, and so that, that was really nice. It was like, oh, you know, I've got my crepe myrtle trees and, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, and then we were walking around the house and I noticed down one side of the house, it's lined with crepe myrtle trees. And uh, after we were here unpacking our stuff and, and putting our furniture and dishes away and, and, and organizing everything, um, I was standing in the backyard and I noticed two more crepe myrtle trees in the backyard. And then we were sitting in the patio. And it was just a couple days ago. I was sitting on the patio with, with my daughter. And I looked to the side of the house, the other side of the house. And from there, I saw three more crepe myrtle trees. And like I said, it may sound silly, but the Lord is aware of every single desire of your heart. And it's not that they're crepe myrtle trees, but the Lord has provided me a, an abundance of crepe myrtle trees. It's not about the trees so much as it is that the Lord knew my heart and He showed me, you know, here. You know, it's like He, he gave me these trees. I have no doubt. And, and another amazing thing to me is that this house that we bought, uh, was built the same year my husband and I got married. Yeah. And the front is loaded with Indian hawthorns. It's got all the plants that I planted in my garden when I was going through that depression and when I was going through that low time in my life. And the Lord enabled me to say goodbye and to walk away from my past from that. And He gave me a brand new home. Yeah. And from one crepe myrtle tree, he's given me over a dozen crepe myrtle trees. And God is good. God is good. And, and he, he knows your heart. And he knows the desires of your heart. And maybe you won't get it tomorrow or, or 10 years from now or 20 years from now or two days from now. It doesn't matter. You know, what, what's important is he knows your heart. And, and he, he, he's there with you. And He will give you what He promised you. He does not break His promises. So I, I would like to encourage you to keep walking with Him. If you're at a low point in your marriage right now, or if, you, if you, you're a born-again Christian and you just had to file bankruptcy, you know, if um, you're wondering how you're going to feed your family tomorrow, or, you know, you, you're wondering if your teenager is going to come back home, all I can say is to trust Jesus, to keep your eyes on Him. Don't look anywhere else. Don't look to anybody else. Don't look to anything else. Keep your eyes on Jesus because He's the one that is going to help you. He's the one that's going to deliver you and He is the keeper of His Word and His promises. And I wanted to mention something else about Colonel Murphy. I, I started to go back to it and then I got sidetracked. But um, not long after I got saved, uh, I got a phone call from uh, Colonel Murphy and he had moved to another state. He transferred to a different location at that point. And I told him what had happened and I said, you know, Murph, you're not going to believe this. And I told him, my whole testimony, what happened, and how Christ came into my living room and He touched my life, and, and all Murph could keep saying was, praise the Lord, thank you Jesus, praise the Lord, and he, he was elated. He, I'd never heard or seen anybody that excited 
and you know especially about my my salvation and he told me he said you know remember a few years ago when I told you that the Lord had put a burden on my heart for you and for you and little Sarah and that I was praying and I said yes and he said I just want you to know that there's not been a day gone by that I have not been on my knees in tears praying for you and Sarah you know I have prayed every day and he goes and you have no idea what this means to me and he says thank you Lord thank you and for the first time in a few years he had felt that burden lift from his heart and um, I wanted to share that because if the Lord has put a burden on your heart to pray for somebody and no matter how low that person gets and how long it takes please don't give up on that person please don't stop praying for that person you know there, there's many times that Murph could have looked at my life and thought and threw his hands up and said Lord she's a lost cause you know I've been praying for her every day for three years and nothing has happened and you know you need to find somebody else to pray he didn't do that he was faithful to the Lord and he prayed every single day and he interceded for me and he prayed for me when I could not pray for myself and if the Lord puts it in your heart to pray for somebody keep praying and keep believing for that person's salvation because God will deliver he will come through God does not disappoint and long, not long after I got saved uh, Within a couple weeks, my daughter and I started going through the house and getting rid of all of our paraphernalia, our occult paraphernalia. And uh, I had things buried around the house that I had to dig up. And, and uh, we were just filling oops, trash can bags um, full and taking them out to the curb. And I got to my Buddhist altar and I was started to pull that out of the closet and stick it in a plastic bag. And the Lord told me, to wait and so I put the altar back in the closet and I waited and it was on Halloween of 93 uh, I was getting ready to go to church um, Halloween for me is not a day that I can afford to celebrate you know I know that there there are a lot of uh, people that you know and Christians that, that dress up their kids and send them out and stuff like that and and you know and if that's all right with their spirit then then fine but for me personally I I cannot in good faith or good conscience celebrate that day because I I know what goes on that day and uh, and so I choose not to my home chooses not to and uh, so I was getting ready to go to church that night and the Lord told me to recall the altar and so I asked him what I should do with the altar and he told me to take it back and I said I would send it back to my mother and he said no take it back and I didn't know where to take it back because it had been a few years since I had been to any of these meetings and so the next day I looked in the phone book and I, and I found the location and I called them up and this gentleman I got on the phone and he said uh, told me I was making a mistake and I said no you know I want you to take this it's an, an altar and it had a scroll that, that hung on the inside and the scroll was the object of worship and that was the important part uh, the altar is just a, a housing for this this scroll and uh, he told me to you know just keep it and that one day I'll come to my senses and I said no I said I have a, a dumpster in the back of the building here either you take it back or I'll throw it in the dumpster you know, I don't want it and and he said okay you know and then he agreed to give me the address and he asked who he was speaking to and I told him my name and uh, then he asked how long I had been a member and I said well just about all my life and uh, and so then he started you know he said then your your family must be practicing and I said my mother and so he wants trying to get information and I didn't want to give him any information I just wanted to return this and then he's, uh, he asked me my name and I told him and he told me his name and he said that he had just transferred here 
from California. And uh, then he gave me his name. And he's the man that was the head of the headquarters of the organization, the Buddhist religion, where I grew up. It's the same man. And the same man that taught me there's no Jesus Christ. And uh, so I, then I knew, I knew that it was God. And I ended up taking this the altar and the scroll back to him. And while we were talking, uh, he kept asking why I was bringing it back. And I said, I just didn't want it anymore. And he said that, you know, that I need this. And I said, no, you know, actually, you know, I don't. I just want you to have this. And then, and because at this point, I didn't feel led to, to share anything with him as far as, you know, being a Christian or anything, because my objective was to return this. And he said um, he wanted to know why I was doing this. And, and I told him that, you know, I just, you know, I don't need this anymore. And I said, and he said, um, did, is somebody making you do this? You know, typically it's a boyfriend or husband or friends that will make you, you know, tell you you're doing the wrong thing and make you bring it back. And I said, no. I said, you don't understand. I said, I don't have a boyfriend and I'm not married and I don't have any friends. And, and I said, uh, and, you know, I said, when I became a Christian, and that was the first time that it came out, and it wasn't that I wasn't intentionally not telling him. It just never came out. And right then I said, you know, since I became a Christian, I've lost every single one of my friends that I did have. You know, they don't want anything to do with me. And then he said, ah, so that's it. You know, you're a Christian now. That's why you're bringing it back. And I was like, well, not because I'm a Christian. I just, you know, I just don't want this. And then I need to bring it back to you. And he said uh, that it was demons making me do this, the devil. And I said, no, you know, this is what I need to do. And he goes, so what, uh, what happened? I mean, you know, did, uh, what church is making you do this? And I said, no church is making me do this. And he said, um, so what religion are you? And I said, well, I'm a Christian. And he said, you know, you have to have a religion. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, I don't know of, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, you know, did somebody come to your door? And I said, no. And he goes, did, you know, did, uh, did you, somebody give you literature? And I said, no. You know, he's like, then, you know, how did you become a Christian? And I said, well, you don't understand. I said, I know it sounds crazy. And I said, but... I was in my living room in Grand Prairie, Texas, of all places, and Jesus came there, and He touched me, and He changed me, and my life has not been the same. And I said, I don't know how to explain it, you know, and He says, well, that's impossible. And I said, yeah, I know, you know, it sure seems impossible, and I said, but, but it happened, and that's all I know. You know, and He came in, and He touched me, and, and now this is where I'm at, and and I don't need this anymore. You know, I, 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 I'm a Christian. And he said, okay, you know, what, what religion are you? You know, what church do you go to? And I said, wherever they love Jesus. You know, if he is honored and loved and respected there, I love to be there. And he says, oh, well, then you're just like a, you know, weed just blowing in the wind, just whichever way, you know, the wind takes you, that's where you're going to go. And I said, as long as they love Jesus. And then he, he was getting aggravated with me. And at the time, I didn't understand why he was getting mad at me and aggravated. You know, I wasn't trying to be difficult, but I just didn't know, you know. And so he started asking me, you know, are you, are you Baptist? And I said, no. And he said, are you Methodist? And I said, no. Presbyterian? You know, Mormon? He started naming every single religion he can think of. And ask him, you know, are you a member of this? Are you a member of this? You know, does any of this ring a bell to you? And I, and I told him, no. And he goes, you have to belong to something. What do you belong to? And I thought about it. And I, and, and I told him, I said, I read in my Bible. And the only church I could find was the body of Christ. So I guess you can say that I'm a member of the body of Christ. <laughs> and he just, he's, that doesn't make sense. And I said, 
that's all I know. Yeah, and that's what I belong to. And right then the Lord spoke to my heart and, and He said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit you were saved and you let this be your testimony. And like I said, that was nine years ago and to this day, that is my testimony. It wasn't religion that saved me. It wasn't any person that saved me. It wasn't anybody that, that you know, a leader of an organization that saved me. It wasn't a ministry that saved me. It was Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it is so important for me to tell you, and, and this is what I feel, is that, you know, we, we all need fellowship, we all need church, you know, we, we need that fellowship, we need that, that corporate prayer, we need the, 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 the worship together, you know, it's, we need that, but I really need to say, don't let that church or that building or that group of people become your Lord. Always, always keep Jesus first. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. You know, for me, and, and I, I still don't know a lot about all these different denominations, and I, and I don't understand it. I remember the first time I wanted to go to church, and I thought, I'll just look in the yellow pages. You know, and if you live in a big city and you look through your yellow pages for a church, there's thousands in there, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're different denominations, different, you know, twice removed, reformed, you know, second this church, and, and, and it's very overwhelming for a, a baby Christian coming to Christ. You know, you come to Christ and, and, and you want to go to church, you want to you fellowship, and, and, uh, and, and trying to, to just figure out where to go, you know. And so, for me, it was very important, and it still is very important, to let the Spirit of God lead me. You know, that he, He'll take me, and He'll place me where I need to be, and to where I can get fed and, and, and nurtured in Christ. You know, but for me, the, the whole thing is remembering, always, always, in any circumstance in your life, keep your eyes on Him. Never look away. From him. I'd like to share some about the, uh, the recovering part, you know, when the healing part, when, when God comes and, and uh, can take away the pains and the hurts of your past. I'd like to share a little bit about my father in, my, in the earlier part of my testimony. I was sharing that uh, he was an abusive man. And, and he was. He was a very mean man. He was this, just the person that he was. And, uh, I don't make any excuses for child abuse, and I don't make any apologies for it. But one thing that, um, that I do know that years of counseling and books and everything and support groups, um, nothing gave me forgiveness in my heart. And I picked up a lot of tools along the way but forgiveness only came through Jesus Christ. And I'd like to share a little bit about that. Um, my father ended up dying in, um, in a homeless shelter, and it took a few months for them to find relatives that would claim his body. And um, my sister ended up with his remains. They had him cremated. Or the the funeral home went ahead and cre cremated him, and she kept his he, she kept his remains for about a year, and when she was moving away, she decided she didn't want to take him with her and gave her to gave him to my mother, who in turn mailed them to me, and again this is when I was living in Texas, which just happens to be the birth state of my dad, and um, I thought when my dad died that I had forgiven my dad and I just just knew in my heart I had forgiven my dad and and no more issues I don't ever have to deal with these issues again and um, it wasn't until 
my mother sent my father to me that um, I realized I had a lot of unforgiveness and a lot of anger and a lot of hurt that still needed healing. And I was angry that I was having to take this responsibility. And when I received his remains, I thought the right thing to do would be to give him a memorial service. Since none of his family would give him a funeral or a memorial service, you know, I thought, okay, I'll, you know, I'll be the one. And, and I'll take care of this. And, and I started writing a eulogy and it was a very nasty one. It was about what a horrible man that he is or was. And, uh, and that's when I realized I had a little bit of unforgiveness still in my heart. And so I um, started working on a second one and it's like, okay, I can't just badmouth this man, you know, this dead man. And so, you know, I've got to say something good about him. So I started writing about all the bad things that he's done as far as how we should not live this way. You know, he did this and he did this, but you know, we should try to live our lives differently. And, so, and that wasn't working. And so finally, I thought, okay, I need to contact some people that knew him because I hadn't seen him in years. And you know, I didn't know a thing about him. I didn't know any more about him other than he was homeless and a chronic alcoholic. And that, that's all I knew. And um, I contacted the homeless shelter and the reverend there at the shelter, and then plus the staff members at the shelter remembered my father well, very well. And uh, they even put in writing what they remembered and, and had mailed it to me so I could have it to add to the eulogy. And uh, I had learned through that phone conversation that my father, my dad, had uh, received Christ and that he had made, gone up to the altar to pray to be, and to be prayed over many times and that he is also, he many times had prayed for his family and because he knew that he had done some horrible things and, and, and he prayed for forgiveness and, and I know for somebody having gone through that type of childhood, um, it might seem a little unfair to be able to forgive just like that, you know, and, and, and say, well, you know, how, how can God forgive him? He did all these horrible things, or, or she did all these horrible things, you know, as far as his parents is concerned. And um, I know that to many people it, it seems like it's not fair. But for me, it's like when I was giving my testimony and in that moment there was a change, a life, a phenomenal life change in, in my whole entire being and I knew I wasn't the same. And I know that this happened for my dad and I know that I can't carry I'm not strong enough to continue to carry the, the hate and the hurt and the, the bitterness. You know, I love my husband so much. I can't allow my dad's behavior when I was a child to affect my marriage today. And I know that unless I forgive and truly get forgiveness in my heart, that that unforgiveness is what's going to rule in my marriage and probably ruined my marriage. And uh, it was so important to me. And, and it's not like there's a little light switch you can just flip on forgiveness or flip it off, you know. It's, uh, it's a process. And it took a lot of prayer. I had to, finally, I just came to God and, and I prayed and I just said, Lord, I know I need to forgive. And I'm just praying for the willingness to forgive. Let me be willing to forgive. You know, show me how to be willing to forgive. You know, because I don't know where to start. I don't even know where to start. And, um, and I just, I kept praying that. And then finally started writing the third, going having the third go at his uh, eulogy. And all I know is that something in me just, just broke at that time, or gave at that time. And there was a, a release of, of of all the bitterness and, and the anger, um, 
it's hard to put into words the, the, the release that comes with forgiveness. And it's not the forgiveness that you create in your own mind or that the, you know, the book tells you how to forgive. And, and, and it's the kind of forgiveness that Christ gives. And it's, it's like He forgives me and I forgive my Father. And it's, it's not because I have to or I need to, but because Christ is in my heart and Christ moved in my heart to forgive. And there's a big difference. You know, like I was talking about the year ago, before that, when I thought I had forgiven my father, I really, truly did. I believed I forgave him. And uh, it wasn't until the Lord started dealing with me about forgiveness that I realized I didn't forgive him. Yeah. And so, anyway, to have this um, memorial service for him at my home with my friends who did not know him, um, that was real important to me because at this point I realized he's not only my dad but he's a brother in Christ and none of my other family members were saved and 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 I just to me it was a blessing it became a blessing all over the sudden instead of a burden that I could give him a Christian burial you know a Christian memorial service I can pray over his remains you know I could pray over his life and and all of a sudden, it, it became an honor for me. You know, um, when I wrote the eulogy, I started out with saying something like that I've spent a lifetime hating this man, or loving, hating this man that I love so dearly. You know, you can love somebody so dearly, but hate them with, with your whole life, you know, because all the injustice that was done to you at their hands. and. And, um, and it's like the Lord brought the whole relationship full circle, you know, because not only did my father give his life to Christ and did Christ forgive him, that I got to take his remains back to his hometown and bury him alongside his family, you know, and, and it was just like a full circle. And for me, that's important because that's something I needed to do. And the Lord knew that. You know, it's like I was talking about earlier. The Lord knows our hearts and He knows our breaking points and He knows exactly what we need and, and where we're going and how we're going to get there. And, and, you know, again, that's why we need to really keep our eyes on Him. You know, and the Lord knew that I needed that. And my dad needed that. We needed each other. You know, I needed to take his remains back to his hometown and, and I needed to have him buried there. You know, and so to me it was like an honor, you know, like carrying his bones back home. So, you know, like in the, in the biblical days when they would talk about that. And um, uh, it's just, um, it, it was a wonderful thing, you know, to work through all of that. And even though my family, a lot of my family can't understand, you know, that, that forgiveness. Well, how could you forgive him? And uh, all I can say is that it, it's Christ in me and through me that gives that forgiveness. You know, because I, I'm sure that, that without that, I can be as bitter as I want, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just, um, the Lord has healed that. Yeah, and, and it's not just with my dad, it's with, with everything that was broken in my life. The Lord is healed. And, and, and He just keeps on healing, and He keeps on blessing, and, you know, and He keeps on growing me up in Him, and, 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 and He just, there's never a day that He's not in my life. And even if I don't feel Him some days, you know, I know enough to know that he's right there, you know, regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I think, he is right there. And he's just been evident in my life in, in, in every aspect, you know. Um, sometimes we go through hard things that, that we don't understand, and, and I don't claim to have all the answers for it, but uh, something else that I, I really feel like I need to share is that um, a couple years ago, 
like I said, my husband and I have been married for six years, uh, and we had tried to have a baby, and even went through the whole fertility thing and prayer thing, and and uh, it just wasn't happening, you know. And um, the doctor says because of me, I wasn't ovulating, and that put a burden on my heart because my husband's never had his own kids, you know. This is his first marriage, and and. Uh, I just, I, I feel like I'm cheating him out of something. And that, you know, is a real, a really difficult thing to live with and, and to, to work through. And uh, a few years ago, or a couple years ago, we had to, we moved to England. And uh, we were there for about 18 months. And uh, just a little over 18 months. And right prior to coming back, like a month before, uh, we had taken a trip to France. and. And anyway, I ended up pregnant, and uh, I called my doctor here in America and, and told him, and, and they were elated. Everybody was excited, and, and then a few days later, I started spotting, and then I started bleeding, and ended up losing the baby. And um, I guess I don't know, you know why I, I needed to share this, but I, I, just, I feel like that it is important, and uh, I, that hurt. I think that was one of the biggest hurts that I've ever received after Christ came into my life, you know. And uh, there's nothing that, that anybody can say that can replace that baby, you know. Um, the hurt is very real, you know, and, and, uh, and I miss that child. You know, and I know that child's with Christ. And, you know, I went through a period of, of damning myself, thinking that, you know, maybe God doesn't think I'm a good parent. Or maybe God's punishing me because I was horrible to my daughter before I got saved. Now, my Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible doesn't say anything about punishing like that. You know, and so I picked that thought up somewhere else, whether it was in some movie or a soap opera or a book or somebody's conversation. I have no idea where I picked that up, but that seed was planted somewhere in my head, and it, that seed caused me torment. You know, and again, I had to go back to Christ, and I had to put my faith in Him. And I had to keep my eyes on Him and go back to what the Word of God says. And time hasn't, hasn't healed the wound. I still cry when, it, when I think about losing the baby. You know, it, it's very painful for me. And maybe somebody that's listening to this lost a baby. And I just want you to know that it's not because you did anything wrong. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because God has forsaken you. It just, it happens. And it happened. And like I said, I don't know why. But I do know that it's not because of these things. You know, again, I don't, I don't claim to have any answers, but what I do know is that Christ is there, and He's with you, and He'll hold you through your hurts, and He'll walk with you, and you'll get to the other side, you know, and one day you'll notice that you're sitting on this ledge on the mountainside and looking down over your life. And it's like, wow, look how high I've climbed. You know, you don't even realize that you've climbed. You know, and maybe I'm getting ready to start a new climb. But I know that next ledge is going to be there. And Christ is going to sit on that ledge with me. And we're going to look back and go, wow, I went even higher, you know. And um, in spite of the hurts and, and things like that, you know, I just... I've been so blessed, and I can't even imagine being blessed more 
because I, I have no clue what more is. You know, my life is so, so good. Even with the hurts and the disappointments, you know, and, and, and the day-to-day -day struggles and, you know, hormones, you know. <laughs> life is a struggle. But, you know, I know that I know that Christ is there and He's with me. He's with my family. He's in my house. He's in my life. And He's holding me and He's guiding me. And the same Christ that's leading me can and will lead you. You know, and I've always heard that, that He's a gentleman. He doesn't barge His way in, you know. He, he has to be invited, you know. And, and if you let Him in to be the Lord of your life, oh, you just, there's, you know, life will never be the same, you know. And like I said, it's not all, like all, you know, dancing and roses and happiness and everything. And, and even in the hard times, there's joy. You know. And, and it's good. And bless God. <laughs>
to even experience pregnancy, to even have a child of your own. And you've wanted that, and you've, you've prayed for that, and it just, it just hasn't happened for you. That, I know, I know what that's like, because that's me. And I, it was, a, it was a comfort for me to listen to what she shared, to keep, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because He knows, He knows the desires of your heart. He knows, He knows what you want, what you've desired, maybe all your life. Maybe it hasn't been all your life that you wanted a child. It hasn't been that way for me. I didn't want a child when I first became born again, which was about 23 years ago. I didn't want a child. I didn't want a child when I got married. I didn't even think I ever wanted to get married until God got a hold of me and changed my life. But He changed, he changed that desire and gave me this godly man that I have now. You haven't seen him on camera on this broadcast yet, but you maybe have on others. But the child issue, I know he's, he's taken me a long way on that. He's healed me of that. Even though I may seem like I'm not totally healed of that yet, it just touches me to hear because it confirms to me that Jesus, Jesus is in control. He has given me a promise. He has given me, I, don't, I still don't know how that's going to turn out, but He has told me in my Christian walk with Him many years ago that I would have a flock of children, that I would minister to children. That hasn't happened yet, but I'm, I'm trusting Him to work that out however He wants to work that out. So I just want to encourage you, if, if you've been praying and believing, trusting God for a child of your own, however He wants to do that, I pray and I encourage you to continue to trust and believe Him, to fulfill that word that He gave you in your heart. So, and if He's, if he's ministered to you in other ways, like like unforgiveness that maybe you've had in your heart toward one of your parents, or maybe both of your parents, or maybe it's not even a parent, but it's someone in your life, in your past, that has abused you or hurt you in such a way that you never thought or you didn't think you could ever forgive. But now God has gotten a hold of your life, and it, it is so... It is so much easier when we give Him these burdens and don't hang on to them. He wants us to lay them at His feet and not hang on to them and to trust Him, to trust Him to take them from us and to give us that forgiveness in our heart that we need. Sometimes we just we need to just admit, just admit to Him, Lord, help my unforgiveness. Help my unbelief, because that's usually that's where it is. You're you're not believing that you can forgive, you're, and when you're not believing you can forgive, you're not really believing that God will help you forgive, and He'll give you that peace in your heart. So ask Him, ask Him to help you in your unbelief, and ask Him to help you take that unforgiveness away and give you that spirit of love and forgiveness for that person that's hurt you. And I, I really sense in my heart that we need, we need to pray. We need to pray for people. If you, if you would like, if you would like, first of all, if you would like Jesus to come into your life, to come into your heart, if you've never asked Him, or maybe He's been trying to get a hold of you all your life, or maybe, I don't know how long, but you know, you know in your heart how long, you know, how He's maybe been trying to 
reach you, bringing people into your life, you know, talking to you, bringing up Christianity to you, but you've rejected it. If you don't want to reject Him anymore, and I, I pray that you don't, I pray that you, that you will accept Him. And if, if, if you're in that place right now, and if, you, and if your heart is willing, and if you want Jesus to change your life and to give you peace, to set you free from all the hurts of the past, and to heal you, and to give you a life of peace and joy and happiness, and I'm, I'm not saying that just because you are, you become a Christian that there won't be any, any um, problems. There will be. But it, it's through Jesus that we get through them. So I want to pray with you right now. And I, I just encourage you, if, if you are wanting to accept Him, join with me in prayer and ask Him to come into your heart and your life. Okay, right now, and Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you have touched these people's hearts, that you've, you've touched our hearts, Lord, that you've brought Linda to us, that, that you've given her the courage to share what she shared, what she has been through. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you use, use her testimony to minister to continue to minister to hundreds, thousands of people. And Lord, I pray for the person watching right now and that is coming to you right now in prayer, in their heart, and they're, they're wanting their life to change. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, right now. And I encourage you, if you're praying with me, just to follow me right now in this prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to come into my life, to change my life, to give me a new heart. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, of all the sins that I've committed in my past, in my life, of the, the people that I've hurt, or whatever I've done that I know that you wouldn't be proud of. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my life now and to change me and to give me a new life in you. I give myself to you, Lord. I give my life to you to do what you want to do with me. I surrender it all to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you've prayed that, prayer from your heart, I encourage you to get connected. Find yourself a local body of believers in a local church and where you can get rooted and grounded in God's Word and where you can begin to learn and to grow in His, in His ways and in His Spirit because that's where, that's where we all grow. That even, even as seasoned Christians like ourselves, we needed, we need, we need that still. We didn't just need it in the beginning. We still need it, and it is so important that you stay connected to a body of believers, where the the true word of God is preached, and where you can you can grow, grow in His word, and just be all He wants you to be in Him, and. If, if you, um, I don't know what area you are because this video will be playing in many stations in many cities, but if you're in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, I'd like to share with you about a local fellowship that my husband and I attend and would like you to feel welcome to join us anytime. And that, that church is called Granville Christian Fellowship. And the services are on Sunday mornings, and they begin at 10.15. And if you would like to come a little early, there's always a little prayer before the service, about 10 o'clock before the service. People get together and pray for the service. And there's a Sunday school that starts at 9.30 for the children. And our church 
they really, really believe that the children need to be included with the adults. So the, the Sunday school for the children is before the church starts so that they can come out and be in the service with their parents. So our church is called Granville Christian Fellowship and it is on a street called Navajo off Wilson, which if you're from that area, you'll know that it's very close to 44th Street too. I don't have the exact address on me or in my memory right now, but that's where we are located basically and the pastor of the church is his name is Calvin Bergsma and if if you want to know more about that you can call our ministry line to find out the exact address or you can also call our pastor in his number his name is Calvin Bergsma and his phone number is 616-457-2960 so I just encourage you Get yourself connected to a local church if you aren't and if you just became a Christian that is so important to do and if you're if you're not in a church and you've been a Christian for a long time I encourage you get in a church you need the fellowship you need the encouragement you need other other believers there because when one is hurting we all hurt and we're, we're strength for each other. We help each other. It's so important to be part. I mean, you're, you're part of the big family of God, but it's so important to have your own family that you can be close to. And they can help you in times of need. If, you know, and, and times even when, when they may need you. You may be, may be used of God yourself to help them in their times of struggle. We all need every, we all need each other. And the body of Christ needs each other. So I just thank you. I thank you for listening. And I just pray that this ministry has helped you today, has blessed you, and encourage you. If if you would like to somehow let us know that, you're welcome. You're welcome to call our ministry line and share that, or you're welcome to um, send us an email. You can, you can go to our website, preciousTestimonies.com, and there's a place there where you can, you can send email to us. So I just encourage you to get connected to the Lord first and then to a local church a local body of believers in Christ. Thank you, and God bless you for listening. Well, what a blessing this has been to hear uh, Sister sharing earlier how God has been working in her life. And then my wife, Kathleen, she didn't introduce herself. That's Kathleen Rasmussen sharing what she felt the Holy Spirit wanted her to share. I'm Norm Rasmussen, her husband, the one she spoke so highly of. I wish I could live up to that. I can't, but through Christ, I can do the impossible, right? Philippians 4.13 for all you Bible students. Uh, there's a few things. I, I'm the one that was behind the camera filming, and we... You know, we're praying, trying to hear from the Holy Spirit to see what God would have us share uh, on these two-hour broadcasts. And there's a couple of things that came to mind, and in faith I'm just going to speak on them uh, to see if we can give you as much good that we can give you. Um, if you didn't happen to hear uh, Linda's testimony at the beginning, I would encourage you to pray about getting a copy of the broadcast. This is... Uh, we've been doing testimonies. God has called my wife and I to do testimonies now for 10 years, roughly, videotaping them. And we have uh, written testimonies 10 years before that. And, it, you know, you, you hear a, a powerful testimony and you think you've heard about all that God could do in somebody's life only to, to hear someone like Linda's. And it's like, wow, it, it is not your normal testimony, but we've come to realize there are no normal testimonies and as many people as God has impacted with his spirit bringing them to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, we should not be surprised in how God does that 
I just want to share a couple of things that she said. Um, God has a perfect time. You know, she wanted to be saved so bad. And nothing was happening that she could see in her life. And uh, she struggled with, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? And she, she mentioned, I think, God told, she mentioned that she had, there's a perfect time in God. I don't quite remember exactly what she had to say about that. But I just want to share that it's so important if you know very little about God. Maybe you're frustrated, and maybe you can identify, hey, I have prayed a salvation prayer. I've asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, or I've asked God for the things to change, and I see no change. Or maybe you're locked into a hell like she was and didn't know how to get out of it. I've just learned in being a Christian over 20 years that God has a perfect timing for each of us and he has a perfect way to execute that timing and I have learned that that perfect timing will make so much sense years after you have grown in the Lord it makes hardly any sense if any at all when we're going through it but when you look back years later once you've been solidly in the Lord Though you may have struggled, you will look back and begin, the Holy Spirit will begin to open the eyes of your understanding uh, to where you will see the wisdom of God. I can so relate to Linda because I thought Christianity worked for everybody else but me. And I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong to make God mad. I figured... I. I must have done something to upset him because he just wasn't working for me the way it sounded like he was working for everybody else. And um, I came to realize it was about two years after God really invaded my life. Um, when he finally invaded my life, I thought he was a little late. Actually, he was right on time. But God began to impart to me that the issue wasn't so much salvation. It was my stubbornness and my pride, as Linda shared. I wanted God to be my sugar daddy. And I wanted God to do what I wanted him to do, when and how I wanted him to do that. See, that's what I figured a mature, dedicated Christian, I thought that came lot and parcel with being a Christian. That now that you've given your heart to Jesus Christ and you've asked for the fullness of the Holy Spirit and you're doing good with God, you know, things happen. I mean, you can see God answering every prayer, doing everything you feel that he ought to be doing. And lo and behold, I found that it doesn't work that way. That, that God only answers prayers for us, only answers our heart's cry when it's good for us. <clears throat> it must be good for him too. It must be good for other people. So, without getting into a big discussion on it, I don't have a lot of time. Just take heart. God knows what he's doing. He has a perfect time and a perfect way to do what he's going to be doing in your life. And she mentioned something else. Linda mentioned something else. Uh, when God challenged her to forgive her father. Okay. Now, I think that God allows almost every person an opportunity to be offended by at least one person and you want to hate them. Um, maybe that's a strong word, um, but if that's your situation, I want to just share a couple of things that I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to share with you. Forgiveness is not an option. Okay, Forgiveness is not an option. I'm not going to quote the chapter and verse, but Jesus said it. Jesus said, if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. It is the only place that I see in the Bible that says it point blank. Forgiveness is not an option. That's why I say it's not an option. Maybe you've not heard it said. Why is it so important that we forgive those who have hurt us and we believe they don't even deserve forgiveness. I've met people who's made the statement, 
I would go to hell and suffer in, in, in hell for eternity before I would forgive this individual who hurt me. They don't deserve forgiveness. Well, <clears throat> you know what? Not one of us deserves salvation. Not one person who is saved deserves salvation. Every one of us qualify to be hated by God. You know, God has the right to hate every person who has sinned against Him. He has the right. He created us. If we're not serving Him, pleasing Him, we've sinned. He has every right to hate us. But He chose before the foundation of the world to forgive us. Okay? So, because He set the example for us. We even see that if we read where Jesus was on the cross. And the last words that he shared, next to the last words I believe that he shared, was for those who put him on the cross and was putting him through that painful death. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, God didn't have to record that, but he took the time to record that for you and I. Why is forgiveness not an option with God? Well, I don't know all there is to know about it, but I know that because God forgave us in Christ, we have no right to hold on to unforgiveness. But I believe there's a secondary purpose that may be every bit as important. Uh, unforgiveness is as lethal as cocaine addiction, heroin addiction, alcoholism, any addiction that we may be addicted to. Unforgiveness has the potential of destroying us as much as those chemical addictions. But unforgiveness is a spiritual drug. It is the most lethal spiritual drug known to mankind that I know of. Now, I don't know all, but I'm saying God is screaming at us when Jesus says, if you don't forgive, my heavenly Father won't forgive you. I believe God is saying that you are playing with a lethal spiritual drug so devastating, okay, that you don't want to even be sniffing the fumes of it. It's that lethal, okay. Unforgiveness will always do this. Unforgiveness, if we're holding on to unforgiveness, will always put a wedge that the devil has a legal right to put in there. Okay, the devil has a legal right when we're holding on to unforgiveness to rob us of all that we can have in our relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so God wants us to deal with unforgiveness as quickly as we can get it dealt with because it robs us of the peace, the joy, the confidence, the intimacy that God desires for us to have with Him, the Creator. He doesn't want anything robbing us of that intimacy. And so I want to exhort you, if you happen to be one who has been hurt by someone or many people, and you say, well, I can't forgive, I can't forgive. See, Linda shared something really key, and I just want to rephrase it with what little time we have left here if you didn't hear it. The wisest thing that you can do if you're in a situation like that is go to the Lord and say, Lord, you know I can't forgive, but would you help me be willing to start trying to forgive that person? You see, that's all the prayer that God needs to begin to break through that wall that exists. Okay, that's all God needs, but mean it from your heart. And you may have to pray that prayer over and over until finally God will bring his power in and you will be able to forgive that person. And you know what? God may agree that person doesn't deserve to be forgiven out of Christ. But in Christ, if you are a Christian, Okay, if you are a Christian, it's not an option. I don't know that I phrased that quite right. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's going to make some sense out of that to you, okay? As a Christian, we must forgive everybody who has hurt us in some way. It's for our own good. It's also for their good. Because unforgiveness can literally keep them 
from having intimacy with the Creator as well. Okay, there is power in forgiving those who have hurt us. And um, beyond that, I just want to uh, say a couple other things. Um, Oh, there's so much to say. You know, if you're a young Christian, you say, my wife was sharing, well, you need, a, you need a local church. I just want to take the time to add something to that. You do need to get into a body of believers that love Jesus. Linda says, you show me a church that loves Jesus, I'll be, I'll be happy there. Now, she's not going to believe everything they try to teach her. She gets into that Bible. She gets into her Bible. She wants to hear from God. She wants to hear from the Holy Spirit. She's learned how to be her own, uh, I'm able to get this from God, okay? Now, she knows that she can learn from God through the local churches too. But the local church really is a word that we've used so loosely that the enemy has twisted that thing. You see, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're the church. You are the church. And where you go, the church is, okay? I am the church. Linda is the church. Kathleen was the church. If you're a born-again Christian, you're the church. The church means, by definition, the called-out ones, okay? And so when we say you need a local church, it's because most of us have heard that our whole lives, and so we understand that, and God gives grace for that. But I would like to qualify that, at least we add confusion upon confusion. Seek God for a local body of Christian believers who love Jesus, okay? And if they put Baptist on it, if it's, if it's Pentecostal, if it's Lutheran, Methodist, Reformed, don't care what the label is on it, okay? There's really only two people on planet Earth. If you read your Bible and can get this out of the Bible, there's only two categories of people. Those who's going to be with Jesus and those who aren't. Those who aren't going to be with Jesus get to be with their Lord, Satan, for eternity. That's what the Bible says. Um, and so if you belong to this Jesus, and I don't think you would have listened this far if you didn't belong to him, so you're going to, uh, praise the Lord, okay, then um, it doesn't really matter where you fellowship as long as you are not allowed, I mean, people... Get offended because the devil is the master at offending people in the local fellowship of the body of Christ. And people get isolated and say, no, I'm going to get my relationship with God worked out. Me and my Bible, me and the TV, me and the Christian radio stations, me and my literature. And, and many people have had to go through seasons like that where that is healthy for them to heal. I know, my wife and I have been in that position, okay? But I also knew that I can be shutting off God from flowing through me because there are other people who need the giftings that God has given me. You have a call, a purpose that God will fulfill in the lives of others as long as you're coming around God's people. But if you let the devil shut you off in that, okay, it can stop the laying up of treasures in heaven for you. Okay, so pray about that. Don't let the devil isolate you too long with being separated from a local body of believers, okay? And if you can't find a church building or a place where you can just get with one or two Christians that God brings to you and, and pray with them and share with them and 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 that's